folks, this is Ben from Road to VR, and I'm here with Paul Yost of YEI Technology, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the Frio VR system. But first, I want to ask a little bit about who you are and how you got to where you are now, manufacturing a, a, a lot of different um, inertial systems. Okay, uh, essentially, the, the YEI was founded as a way for me to take research that I was doing while I was a college professor out of the lab and into the real world. And one of the frustrations I had when I was in that kind of academic world was that we would do all these cool research projects, do all these cool things, but we would never really get to see them go out and do something real and help people or do things for people. And I found that incredibly frustrating that we do all this interesting stuff, this fascinating stuff, this powerful stuff, and then never get to see it do something. So in 1999, um, I had an opportunity to partner with somebody who could handle a lot of the business stuff, who had a similar vision for uh, making a technology-based company take some of that research and do stuff, and kind of took advantage of that and started the, at the time we were Yoast Engineering Incorporated. Uh, we recently changed the name because we've kind of diversified into a lot of different areas now, but essentially what started as my research interests in artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, uh, and a bunch of other kind of high-tech areas grew into this company doing essentially R&D that then we get to turn into products, turn into intellectual property, and then see them do things in the real world. And that's kind of where we are now with the Prio VR. How we came upon that was kind of in two ways. We were working on these robotics projects, dynamic robotics projects that required sensors to do very high accuracy, very quick dynamic uh, sensing of inertial uh, movements of a robotic system. and nothing that was on the market actually fit our needs so we decided to do what we do with a lot of things and that's make our own uh, the typical engineering solution is we can do something better than the things that are out there and that's what we did and we so we started producing those inertial sensors and then things kind of came full circle uh, with those that we realized along the way that not only can you use these to uh, measure robots doing things or get uh, input from uh, the position of robots but you can put them on organic systems like humans and do that as well and that kind of brought me back full circle like I said to uh, virtual reality work that I was doing in uh, college that I had an interest in that and that interest had kind of remained over the years but then it brought us into the motion capture world and back into the virtual reality world and it was kind of this um, perfect storm of what we needed to do for our projects then coming around and aligning back with some of the interests that I had and other team members had to actually turn those high accuracy sensors into something that works for uh, gaming or immersive simulation purposes. So we've seen the three space uh, sensor system that you guys showed uh, as a virtual reality motion capture system, uh, at least as a prototype of one, for about a year now. Um, but now you recently launched Prio VR, which brings prices significantly down and performance up, is that correct? Correct. So how did you get to that, that new threshold of lower prices and higher performance? Um, there's, there's a, again, this kind of uh, convergence of technology that are, and different things that are happening there. One of them is that we got the prices down by, once we realized that there was a demand or a need besides just our own kind of internal excitement about having virtual reality, that there's the, the kind of Oculus came out, other virtual reality uh, accessories were starting to come out, and so there was this kind of cultural switch that was starting to make the, a move towards making virtual reality systems possible. But in addition to that, the uh, technology for inertial sensing has come down in cost as they've become more commodity items and more ubiquitous, like everywhere. You have accelerometers and gyroscopes uh, in those systems. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was to take advantage of that while there's this kind of cultural move toward virtual reality and we have this expertise in accurately sensing the motion of things and uh, the influx of low cost commodity sensors to combine those three things and allow kind of the our piece of the puzzle to be the inertial motion capture uh, but at a consumer price point and so in order to do that we've done complete redesigns of our entire uh, hardware stream um, and we've really really worked hard to value engineer things so that we get the lowest possible cost uh, possible that, and position ourselves for very high volume uh, sales of those and so it's kind of this again these, this confluence of events of uh, commodity sensors plus the culture that is now embracing virtual reality as something that is possible 
uh, along with our expertise at the point at that particular time of being able to provide our piece of that puzzle all coming together at the right time, right place, I suppose. And can you tell me a little bit about specifically what are the differences between the three space and uh, the Previar sensor that actually, uh, how, how does the performance compare? Um, the sensors themselves, uh, performance essentially in our complete redesign, not only have we been able to lower cost, but we've also been able to improve performance dramatically. That The gyroscopes we're using in the Prio VR uh, have a, a bias instability, which is kind of the measure of how good the gyroscope is at maintaining that position accurately over time and not drifting. We're an order of magnitude better, so we're somewhere around uh, one and a half degrees per hour of bias instability uh, drift on the gyroscopes, where on the existing three space sensors we're around 11 degrees per hour, which 11 degrees isn't bad compared to other um, gyroscope systems, uh, but compared to the Prio VR sensors, it's a, again, an order of magnitude is a, a large uh, improvement. Also, we're using uh, different magnetometers, and while we've been also improving the sensor hardware, we've been spending a lot of R&D time in improving our calibration and error compensation and uh, magnetometer perturbation rejection algorithms as well. So we've been spending a lot of R&D time on algorithmic improvements in addition to the hardware improvements that we have. And all, again, all those things are kind of coming together in not only the Prio VR, but also we're redesigning all of our three space sensor family as well to take advantage of those same improvements that we're uh, both algorithmic and hardware-wise that we're making. So. so today we saw for the first time a functional prototype of the Prio VR, the actual Prio VR sensors. How will those change from prototype to final product? Um, the main ways that those are going to change from prototype to product is, again, the, the prototypes that we have working right now are kind of an intermediate prototype that has some of the older sensor technology uh, combined with the new form factor and some of the new uh, protocol uh, methods that we're using. So the final version will be, again, this one step further into lowering the cost, uh, making the circuit design uh, simpler. And also we have a little bit of ways to go on the connector technology for how do you link all these things together in a way that's easy for people at home to do without it taking uh, much effort to do that. And so the, the those are the main hurdles that we have left as far as the sensors or how do we have them interconnect easily uh, and how do we, again, get the cost as low as possible without sacrificing performance. And so those are the remaining things that we're still working on. But those that, those will come together fairly quickly. We have a roadmap for that. We have a schedule for that. So really, sometime uh, late spring, and actually early spring, we're going to have the final prototypes of the sensor hardware done, and then move on to the next piece of the puzzle, which are pieces of the puzzle, which are the uh, wearable hub and the wireless base station, which those, again, are a little more linear development. So we're pretty sure we can keep on our time schedule for all of the development of that as well. So. Can you tell us a bit about the latency of the pre OVR system and, and how it's different than uh, that of the three space system? Yeah, the, essentially the due to the architectural change, the existing three space space system uh, has all of the sensors wirelessly communicating simultaneously and streaming data, which creates this problem where the bottleneck becomes the bandwidth, the wireless bandwidth itself, that there's a lot of packet contention uh, and packets get dropped. Uh, as the sensors kind of compete for that bandwidth space. Uh, what we've done with the Prio VR system is we switched to this centralized wireless model where all of the sensors through wires communicate with a wireless uh, wearable hub that then packetizes all of the sensor data and sends it as one packet so there's no chance for contention unless you have multiple systems. And then even with multiple systems, uh, we project that you'll be able to get up to uh, one or two dozen of these systems working simultaneously without it being unusable or with it still being uh, fairly uh, responsive and usable. As far as the latency goes, uh, what we're getting out of our current setup uh, is the number of orientations per second out of the existing three space suit is we're getting somewhere around 80 or 90. And we have to do some exotic things because of those contingent things with using multiple wireless dongles and uh, multiple channels and things like that. Whereas with the Prio VR, we're projecting to get somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 to 240 orientations per second and at a latency that's somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 10 or below. In, in our calculations and in practice, we think we're going to get somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 to 7, but I don't want to guarantee that just yet, but it's going to be uh, a very high fidelity, very uh, low latency uh, system. And when you compare that with the 
the Connect, which is around 90, or the new Connect has been rumored to have uh, latencies around 60. Um, we are at one sixth of the new Connect, which hasn't even been released yet, which is for something where you need that immediate feedback, immediate um, uh, dynamic response to your motions uh, that gamers are going to want, then the Prio VR is going to fit that uh, very well. So for the Kickstarter, uh, it seems like there was a decent amount of confusion regarding what the final um, system would be, because we saw the prototype um, or the, the previous three space sensors strapped on, but you're looking at a final production product that is more of a suit, right? Can you clear that up for some people? Yeah, it's essentially the, the final product is going to be is the, and again, the, the video confusion was our fault for not having done this before. There are a lot of things we would do different. So we, we thought the video would show kind of the capability and people would kind of make that mental jump to, oh, they're making a, a, a lower cost suit version of this. But showing something people in a video where they see that suddenly that puts that, them, that that's in their mind is what they're getting. And so we should have done a better job explaining exactly what it was they were getting. But the, the final version, what it's going to be, is kind of this uh, hybrid approach where it's a, a vest that you put on, very easy to put on, has the sensors and the hub already attached to it. So you put that on, and then the only things you have to connect at that point would be the legs if you have a full body suit or the, the arms. Uh, and so those, again, very easy to put on. Um, slide your hand in, put a couple straps on, uh, same thing on the other one, plug those in and then you're ready to go. So what we're looking at is something that in under uh, two minutes you can have pull, pick up, put on, and be ready to use in your end application very easily. So at this point the Kickstarter uh, has somewhere in the neighborhood of $85,000. You said you were concerned that you may not end up hitting your goal. What are your plans if that happens? Uh, essentially what we're going to do is, the it's not certainly not the end of the road for the project, but uh, what our plan is if we don't hit the goal is that we have learned a lot from this experience. This is our first crowdsource funding model development effort that we've gone through. And so what we're going to do is take all of those lessons that we've learned, including the ones that have been really hard and uh, very uh, unexpected for us, uh, and regroup and probably launch another Kickstarter uh, or another crowdsource funding uh, attempt sometime in the spring, sometime around GDC is what we're planning. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to continue working on the product. We're going to continue working on developing the um, demo videos and the technology and con and actually continuing to send out updates just like uh, as if we had gotten the funding. The, because the a lot of the work uh, we can continue working on, the funding helps with mass production kinds of things. The funding helps with guaranteeing us a volume where we can get the prices to those lower points. So we're going to continue with the product development regardless. Um, of the success of this campaign and then regroup and then go from there. But the technology and the idea is uh, too good for us to give up on and we're at this point we are continuing to work on it even uh, as we speak. I've, I'm getting text messages from people working on the stuff and asking me questions. So it's the kind of thing that uh, the supporters we have have been very uh, vocal and very supportive so we're, we're glad to have people on our side and going to continue fighting the fight to get the the system out there because we think it's a good technology and a good system. So Now today we saw demos with 3Space uh, with UDK and Unity. How are developers going to, or how easy is it going to be for developers to develop with this for virtual reality? Uh, essentially our goal for making things uh, easy for developers is to make it as easy as possible. So that's what we're planning on doing and uh, what we're already doing is making our APIs very compatible with uh, pretty much the three major gaming engines, but not only those, but also making this open API that you can call from any programming language or any programming environment. Uh, and so we're already well on the way to doing that. Um, we're also, over time, we have a roadmap for embedding more and more abstract layers of processing into our uh, API. So essentially what we want is to have drop-in support so a, a user can, uh, or a developer can take our API and extract the um, not only the pose of the character but also extract the um, inertial information from that character if they need to or extract the pedestrian tracking information that walks the player around the map from our um, system very easily. So our goal is to have all of that by that late May date uh, functional and ready to go. So essentially by the time people get their uh, suits in hand 
they'll be able to have not only some of our example code, which I said, again, I said was going to continue to evolve and we'll continue to push that, but they'll have the API um, and uh, develop along with the developer kit to allow them to seamlessly just drop these things into their own uh, uh, development environments very easily. Um, is it possible to extend the system to hand or finger tracking? And if so, how accurate could that be? Uh, yeah, and actually that's that's in our formal development plan is we're planning on adding a pre-OVR compatible glove as soon as we get this product or this project up and running. Uh, we want to start working on those accessory items like the glove uh, and it would be relatively easy. We've actually done some finger tracking uh, with our sensors previously. Uh, there are obviously some logistic things in getting all of that package in a glove that involve manufacturing gloves, which we are not a glove manufacturer, but it's the same kind of thing as a vest, so we can figure that stuff out. And so that is next on our development uh, schedule. In the meantime, what we're doing is we're supporting uh, essentially uh, Wii nunchuck controllers to allow for finger interactions or interacting with things in the environment, which is also a lot of gamers requested that because it's a, a interface they're used to, an analog stick with some trigger buttons, and those fit nicely with first-person shooter or other games, and it's a, a, a model that gamers are used to interacting with. So we're supporting those uh, with our existing model now. Eventually we'll get to the glove, uh, but we need to get this project off the ground first. And that, But that is the absolute next thing on our development roadmap following the Prio VR suit uh, becoming successful is working on the, the glove add-on because that's the next step and if you want to be in that virtual world and touch things and manipulate them in a natural way, an analog stick and triggers isn't really the best thing for uh, a natural way to interact with things and it's using your hands. Uh, uh, along with, we have some plans for some sort of tactile feedback or some sort of at least haptic uh, aspects to that as well. But again, we'll have to get the pre-OVR successful first and then we'll focus on that, but mm -hmm. it is on our roadmap. So we have the Oculus Rift, which is a suitable head-mounted display, and the consumer model is expected to improve a number of important things. Um, we have a lot of interesting motion tracking systems in the works, and uh, hopefully some other people will be jumping into the head-mounted display space to up the competition. It's a lot of exciting stuff right now, but what do you think is next for virtual reality after all of that? Um, I think what's next for virtual reality is kind of this multifaceted question. One of them obviously being that the quality is going to improve, the field of views are going to become better, the, um, the prices are going to go down as competition increases like you say, but there's also it needs to be this uh, addition of um, additional senses. For example, haptic feedback uh, systems uh, are going to become uh, desired. Uh, for players as you want to experience those virtual worlds in more ways than just visually or uh, orally. Uh, it's going to become more important for people to experience touch in those worlds or some kind of force feedback or some sort of um, uh, environmental effects in those environments. But then the other side of that is there, I think that there needs to be a kind of combining of forces to make this all-in-one package system that can be targeted because right now it's up to consumers to buy the head-mounted display from one vendor, an omnidirectional treadmill from another vendor, the uh, motion sensing or motion capture system from another vendor, and then piece all of that together into one system themselves. Uh, and from my perspective, it's kind of like expecting people to buy a car by going and buying the wheels and the engine and the body and the seats and then putting it together themselves, where the ultimate thing that's best for consumers is to have you go to this one place, you have this uh, one system that you buy that does all of the stuff that you needed to do and that also helps developers target that one system uh, in an easier way. Uh, the question is, is how that would affect price but once you get to the point where you have multiple vendors targeting systems like that I think is where we start to see this virtual reality become this universal thing that is uh, everywhere uh, and at that point uh, it, I think is where the real fun and the real content large amounts of content begin to become um, uh, available for those systems. So. Okay, Paul, I just want to say thank you very much for coming to show yeah, us the thank system. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having us.